start without him. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're going to get started. Um, if you would take your seats. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Olson. I'm the Associate Director of the Latin America Program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and I want to welcome you to our event on Haiti, uh, Escaping the Crisis Trap, New, New Options for Haiti, a uh, presentation of a, a very interesting and fine report. Um, before we get going too far, I want to turn this over to Ann Applebaum, uh, Director of the Legatham uh, Institute and Director of their Transitions Forum. Um, the, she has been very supportive of this process, and we are grateful to her and the Institute for their support for the report and this, this event, and I welcome your comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, so just, just to a brief word of explanation, first thank you again to the Wilson Center for hosting this event. Um, this is a report that's a joint product of the Legatum Institute and the Institute for State Effectiveness, which is where Claire Lockhart works. Um, it's part of a series that Legatum um, publishes of case studies. Um, what we try to do is look at countries and look at particular kinds of, usually political but sometimes economic problems, um, from, from different angles. Um, we try to get people who are not necessarily experts in one country, to, we try and move them over to look at others. Cl uh, Claire's background is in Afghanistan, Indonesia, um, and elsewhere. We asked her last year to do some work on Syria for us, just to, to, to give a new eye, and we asked her and Joanna Mendelson Foreman to put together this report on Haiti. Um, I know that many of you are Haitian experts, and much that's in here will be will we'll be familiar, but we were hoping they could recast it, re-describe it, um, and, and inject some new ideas into, in, 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 into the discussion. What we like to do with our reports is take them to different places. We're presenting it here in Washington with the help of the Wilson Center, which we're very grateful for. And we will, I hope at some point, take it to Haiti. Um, we will also at some point, I hope, take it to London. Um, and and our, our idea is not just to publish something that gets forgotten, but to um, to, to create a series of conversations around it. I know that Claire and Joanna have been, have been, have shown it to and discussed it with people in Washington and New York um, already, and we'll, we'll, we'll continue that process in, in the coming weeks. So anyway, thank you. I think Eric is going to moderate, and he will introduce the, our extremely distinguished panelists, uh, one of whom has come here from Haiti, as will be explained. Um, and I, I, I welcome you all to this event, and thank you very much. Thanks, Anne. And uh, we have bios of our speakers uh, out on the table, so I won't belabor that a great deal. Uh, I'll just uh, introduce them briefly. We'll hear first from the two uh, co-authors of this report, uh, uh, Claire Lock Lockhart, who is a co-founder and director of the Institute for uh, State Effectiveness uh, Center and works on a wide range of, uh, with countries in transition. Uh, from working on issues of instability and moving to stability uh, and from poverty to prosperity. And then we also have uh, Joanna Mendelson Foreman, a well-known uh, scholar, uh, policymaker, uh, author, researcher, friend uh, here in Washington, D.C., and is currently a scholar in residence at the American University. She's also a senior advisor at the Stimson Center's Managing Across Boundaries program here in Washington, D.C., along with many other hats that she's wearing and worn over the years. So welcome to the two of you. We're also delighted to have uh, two speakers uh, f from Haiti. Uh, uh, first, we'll hear from Hans Tippenhauer, who is uh, an entrepreneur. Uh, based in Port-au-Prince, who's we're glad welcome uh, to joining us here today. Uh, he's a management consultant and social entrepreneur. Uh, he's co-founder and executive vice president of the Body Aistisa, a mining development and construction company, and has been involved. We had dinner last night with him, and had been involved in many of the uh, political and social processes in Haiti over the years. Uh, and then last but not least, Jocelyn McCullough, who I'm sure many of you who uh, have lived in Washington and New York know uh, of his work, he served as executive director of the National Coalition for Haitian Rights and of the New Jersey Immigration Policy Network. 
He was the founder of the Haitian Studies Association and has served on the board of the National Immigration Forum along with many other organizations. The two of them will comment uh, after our authors have presented their findings and their report and then we'll have time for questions after that. So thank you very much. Um, Claire, I think, is going to lead us off and then followed by Johanna and I guess we'll just, uh, well, Hans will go third and then uh, Jocelyn will end up the presentation. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, first to Legatum Institute and Anne Applebaum and her colleague Chloe Dupronoff in particular for partnering with us on this project and, and their support to it and to the Wilson Center for hosting us today. Uh, the context for this report um, is, is very much in line with ISE's work over the last decade. Uh, in 2005, my colleagues and I left Afghanistan, and it, it, this included a number of ministers from <coughs> Afghanistan, and they left with very, very heavy hearts. Um, they were leading the reform process, but they knew it couldn't continue. And the primary reason it couldn't continue was actually the way the aid system was working. This was the biggest constraint, paradoxically, to the task of building stability and institutions. Um, with, with very heavy hearts, um, a group of us, which included my co-author on Fixing Failed States, Dr. Ashraf Ghani, um, set out uh, with, with a group to look around the world at whether this problem of aid and the way it was working was unique to Afghanistan or whether there was a common pattern. And we spent time in South Sudan, in Somalia, Kosovo, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Haiti. And we found that while, of course, every country is unique, there were a set of common patterns as to why this incredible generosity of taxpayers, an incredible effort of dedicated individuals, somehow wasn't meeting, living up to the, to the promises. Um, but we also set out to, to look at countries that had transformed successfully. And we found, of course, around the world, including in the last two or three decades, there are a tremendous number of success stories where countries have managed to transform successfully. And of course, again, each of their paths are unique to a particular time and context, but there was something of a common pattern um, to how the leadership within those countries and their partners from the outside thought about leading those transformations. Um, so equipped with this um, kind of knowledge, we um, in 2008, we were invited um, then by Robert Greenhill, who was the president of Canadian CEDA, to, to take a look at um, Haiti. And we did this just in the wake of a report that many of you may be familiar with um, by the National Academy of Public Administration called very starkly Why Foreign Aid to Haiti Failed. Um, and this was back now more than five years ago. And we built on their recommendations to take something of a deeper look at why wasn't it working, but also what was working and where the potentials um, lie. And we completed that in 2008. Um, then after the uh, tragedy of the earthquake, um, we've been watching as um, there's been immense effort and, and some of it very, very successful um, to respond to the tragedy and, and seek to um, work on the recovery, the response, the recovery phase, and look forward to Haiti's next phase of development. But we thought it was time, and, and with the, in partnership with Legatum, to revisit the situation, particularly to look again at what are the lessons. Um, can we learn from what was done right in Haiti, but also where the gaps were? Why did the results fall short of the promises? Um, but also look forward with Haitians to what the next chapter of Haiti's de development might look like. What can be built upon? And particularly, and, and as we'll hear from Johanna, where do Haitians themselves um, think the, the trajectory of the country should go? Um, I'll reflect briefly on some of those lessons and then um, argue for an opportunity lens before handing over to, to Johanna, who's really thrilled and delighted, agreed to collaborate on this project and knows um, far more than me due to her decades of involvement in, in Haiti. Um, what are some of those lessons? And, and we see these are actually, again, unique to Haiti, but some common commonalities with a lot of other contexts. And the first of those we found in, in many of the evaluation reports, um, including um, those authored by the UN and, and USAID and others, but a, a sense of lack of real Haitian ownership over the relief and reconstruction agenda. Often lip service was given to Haitian ownership, but the net result was that many Haitians that we, we found felt that they'd been marginalized, they'd been excluded from the priority setting, the design, and the implementation. 
Second finding, and, and, and going deeper along these lines, the failure to use funds to invest and empower Haiti's, Haiti's government, business, and civil society. The vast majority of the funds went to foreign contractors, foreign NGOs. They didn't find pathways to grow Haitian businesses, um, to grow the budget of, of Haiti's um, government, or invest in civil society. Third, the failure of the design and planning to match the Haitian context. Um, and we've seen this in many countries around the world. I'll give one concrete example. Uh, when my colleagues and I were working in South Sudan, uh, just as the new government was being formed back in 2006, um, we, we revisited a couple of years later, and there was a lot of disappointment by some of the ministers. They said, we've got all this money. They actually had a lot of money from the oil money that was coming from the north, but we can't spend it. Um, and it's, what, had, what had happened was that the procurement timetables and cycles that the external donors had imposed didn't actually match the climate of, of South Sudan. So they were expected to do all the design and the architecture work when it was sunny during the dry season. And then they were expected to do the building when it was raining. Um, so they had to wait. So these delays were brought in. They couldn't do the building because it was too wet. As soon as the weather had dried up, the money expired. And they kept going through this cycle because of this mismatch of the rules and the procedures to the reality of the context. Just one, one concrete example. Um, the next, the lack of accountability and transparency in the use of funds. And again, paradoxically, that sometimes comes not um, because of lack of requirements of auditing and accounting and reporting, but because of too much. Um, but it's a failure to get those accountability rules and transparency rules right. And then the failure to get scale right. And what we found, I think, in, in looking through this process at Haiti, but in many other countries, we have this donor rush where tens of thousands of NGOs, many of which doing superb work with great courage and commitment, and each individual project might be right, but the net effect is tens of thousands of small projects, that, and the whole is less than the sum of the parts, because the very fragmentation of the effort creates its own coordination problem. Um, so how do these efforts scale? Um, so that one program can reach many, many villages or many schools rather than each one having to have its own chain of contracting and management. So these are some of the problems, but what we found is, this, this is what we, we discovered was some of the, the problems in, in Haiti, but we've also very similar to, to problems in, in other countries. Um, one of our rules is that we can only spend up to a third of our time criticizing, and we have to spend two thirds of our time on the positive solutions. So with that much more optimistic lens, I'd now like to switch to a positive tone um, and just argue that uh, we need to look at Haiti through an opportunity lens, not through this prism of negativity. And we find that actually in many countries, um, the media, and analysts and commentators get trapped into this very negative prism. We catalog all the things that don't work, but that obscures the tremendous assets and potential that are in place. In fact, it's embedded in the very way that some of the assistance community work. We do needs assessments. And one of the things we've been arguing for is turn that on its head. Let's not do needs assessments, or maybe we need to do them, but let's do asset maps as well. Can we actually have a catalog of all the great potential and the things that are working? And we began to take, as we took that prism to look at Haiti's great potential, um, we've, we've just begun to outline some of these here, but they included um, very promising growth sectors, um, assets within the society, within the country that can be built on, including the construction sector, agriculture, light and livestock, tourism, mining, telecommunications, light industry. The fundamentals are there for a vibrant economy that does provide jobs that can create revenues if the right approaches are taken. Very strong social capital in the communities that could be the basis for self-organization of, of reconstruction and development. No need that Haiti need be reliant on NGOs coming from the outside to do basic tasks of building and repairing canals and building small roads. Um, the, the capacities exist within the society. Um, an education sector, which very promisingly has been investing at the, the secondary and higher education levels, which is different from a lot of other countries that have only focused at the primary level. Um, a tremendously vibrant diaspora um, and a very advantageous geographic location. So many countries that do get trapped in the crisis, trapped are landlocked, and of course, Haiti isn't. Um, so a huge call for looking at the positives as well as the negatives. And with that, I'll hand it over to Johanna. They're on. They're on. Oh. Well, thank you, uh, Eric and Claire. Uh, 
and everybody who is in this room who really have a deep commitment and engagement with Haiti uh, to join us in following what Claire has said of looking at Haiti through the opportunities and not the catastrophe that struck the island in uh, uh, 2010, which was the devastating earthquake, which we all know. And I think what I would like to focus on on this are the recommendations that are available in the report. But let me say one thing, because I think I see her in the back of the room. Cindy Arnson, who wrote a very good collection on peace processes, once asked me many years ago to contribute to that. And we first asked, why are we putting Haiti in a book about peace processes? And I think the reason we looked at Haiti in a context of peace processes is even though the country had tremendous divisions politically, economically, socially, that there was also the potential for conflict among all of these areas that had not been discussed with the population. And that's why in the recommendations that we looked at in this report, we felt one of the most important pieces of action to follow is a national conversation. We called it a dialogue. We've been corrected <coughs> several times by people who have been readers of this. But the conversation has never taken place, either nationally or regionally, with the citizens of Haiti, not the politicians, the citizens of Haiti, about what their priorities are. Now, the positive news out of Haiti is that there is now a new electoral law. There are potentially going to be elections held in October that will combine both national and local elections. So in that space that we have, how do we use this opportunity for having conversations about the priorities or platforms that citizens want to improve their country? They can't be everything at one time. We know this. this any kind of change is generational. But we will never see stability or security or socioeconomic well-being if individual citizens of Haiti do not outline the priority that they want for enacting certain issues. And as I was telling Hans, who has done some tremendous work with youth, the conversation in Haiti that we want to have, and not we, the outsiders, but Haitians, the insiders, need to have is with the, peop the young population of the country. The saddest commentary that I've heard in, the, in years is by young Haitians who say they don't want to go home when they're b based here because they see no hope in their future. Well, Haiti does have a future, as Claire just outlined so clearly. There are opportunities that are economic, that are social. Uh, people don't realize that this is a part of the world which is not in a conflict. It's not the Sudan. It's not Afghanistan. It's not surrounded by bad neighbors. It's in an area with lots of good governments. It's a trade route. The Panama Canal is just widened. The Mona Passage goes right through. You can have lots of ac e economic growth. And you also have eight sectors of promising economic growth, which Claire has outlined. So what should this conversation look like, and what are the other recommendations? Well, first, I did a little bit of research on national dialogues. And uh, Anne pushed us, as, which was very good, to define what that is. And these are negotiation processes. Haiti's already had a formal national political conversation with a result of something called the El Rancho Accord, which set the elections. It was nimbly done by the Catholic Church through the first Haitian cardinal, who did a wonderful job. But now we need many nimble Haitians in many parts of the country to talk about the things that are needed, education, economic development, which is employment, employment, employment. How do we get young people employed? How do we focus on education? And not only the A's through A through Z's, but also the education that creates vocational skills in the short run to put people on the job market and not in the informal sector. And also energy. Energy security, something that has been my hobby horse, is essential. You can't open a school if there isn't light. You can't be able to create uh, jobs if there's no electricity to run machines. So all of these are part of the dialogue. Also, putting remittances to work. Haiti, 20% uh, of its uh, GDP comes from its remittances. How do you make those remittances work for the government? How do you make them not <coughs> be a product that is stolen? How do you create trust funds that generate revenues? Many people in this room, we know Ambassador Adams has argued for this, to create many kinds of taxes that could be used and viably used to support institutions. Now, one other thing that I'd like to add is that any of these conversations, whether they're national or regional, will have to have legitimacy. We know that there is a leadership vacuum in Haiti. But I don't think we've looked far enough 
to find who those leaders are. <clears throat> we only look at the top level. There are many young leaders that I've met on my trips to Haiti, people who want to work, people who have ideas, people who can tweet, people who have use of the Internet. We have to take advantage of the social media and the access that people have through their cell phones to talk about their priorities. If you can have a consensus, and I know Hans will talk about this and so will Jocelyn, about the things that are to be done after the elections, I think Haiti can uh, you know, reach its potential in all these areas. It won't be an overnight potential, but it will certainly give the requisite hope that people need to say, yes, there is a national platform, there is a plan, and it's a platform that has been devised not by outsiders like us, but internally through a vision that young people have. And just let me talk a little bit about aid effectiveness for a minute, because I don't think I could read another study about Haitian aid, because we know the problems. And it's not limited to Haiti, as Claire well knows. But with the billions of dollars that have gone on into Haiti over the years, we should be able to, at this point, understand that if we don't give Haitians the ability to control the resources that we give them, either through creating a you know, a dual keyed system so that they only get money if there are accountings of this money. We will never create the uh, legitimacy that we really feel is essential to have these conversations. And one last point, since I've always been the person on security, Haiti is secure. We have achieved a tremendous security. Uh, we have overcome a security gap. The MINUSTA has trained police. I think we're almost at the total 14,000 now that was envisioned. <coughs> Haiti is a self-policing country, part of the country in rural areas. The challenge isn't security anymore. The challenge is building on something which is the basis <coughs> for development to make sure that Haitians are able to be the beneficiaries of investment, the beneficiaries of tourism dollars, and that is the thing that we have to do in changing what we say the paradigm to one of an opportunity lens. So I'll stop and turn it over to my Thank colleague. Thank you, uh, Johanna and Claire. I neglected to acknowledge Ambassador Adams, the Haiti coordinator at the State Department. Thanks for coming with us. And, and Joanna mentioned uh, Cynthia Arnson, who's the director of Latin America program. We're glad she can, can join us as well. Hans, I want to turn to you. You're an entrepreneur based in Haiti. Um, you can see, obviously, some of the challenges and as well as some of the opportunities. How does, how does this framework work for you? What do you see? Um, thank you. I, well, I first want to thank ISC for having me here and compliment Claire and Joanna on the wonderful work that they did. I think it's a really good report. Um, i quickly give you a background of what we've been doing with youth also in Haiti, um, working with Fondation Espoir, which is a foundation that I, I'm the president of. And we've been working a lot on developing what we call harmonious development which is really intrinsically having young people develop their potential so that they can help their communities. Um, we've had some success doing it, and, and over the last, I would say, 10 years, um, we've been able to, for example, put them in a, the youth in a leadership training boot camp and tell them you have five days to make a movie. Mm -hmm. And in five days, they were able to make a short movie, a 30-minute short movie. Um, we did that twice and it worked very well and they came up with the scenario they, with the acting and it's so it's a really a population that has a lot of potential um over the years we've trained more than a thousand young leaders um we also trained young candidates um some that are in parliament that went for the senate that went for the deputies um mayors we even coached the president so We've had some success, and we've been able to organize the youth. For example, um, before the elections, we had, you were talking about the texting, we put a text platform where we could survey the population. Um, and we were the first to say that Martelly would probably be the next president. When we did, people did not really believe us, but he was. Um, after that, we realized that there might be frauds in the elections. So we came up with the same platform, used um, text to counter frauds. And when, on the day of the elections, um, we realized that there were a lot of 
troubles with the elections, we sent them a report of all the frauds that we had. And it was documented, like for example, some people would get to a voting booth and they would tell them, what party are you voting for? And if they would say such party, they would then give them 10 ballots. And we had that documented. Um, and it's thanks to them that we were able to say, well, you see, those are the, the, the proofs that some frauds are happening also. Um, and we've also tried to be more ambitious <coughs> and have bigger projects. Right now, for example, we have a convention center um, that we're trying to help build. So we would have that center actually as a dialogue center. Um, but how do we really want to help Haiti? That's First, I think we need to remember that um, Haitians first started the war in 1804, so 200 years ago, fighting for their freedom and fighting against the biggest industry at the time, which was slavery. Um, and when they realized that they would not um, win the war if they didn't become independent, that's how they, they, they decided, okay, we're gonna go for independence. However, the difference between the U.S., who became independent in 1776 and had a president 13 years after, after 13 years of discussion, basically, we had the war and just, um, I would say, a month and a half after, we already had a general governor we, who was Dessalines, and we were ready to ride with Haiti. We never really... We never had the time to sit, have the dialogue, decide what this new country should be, how we were going to interact with the international community. And first, we also realized that the international community at the time was not really friendly because what was a country um, where there was no slaves doing when everyone around still was using that system? It was the biggest industry of the time. Imagine like deciding today that we would kick all the big oil company out of the country and say, we don't want you there anymore. So um, we need to agree that, that um, the development should start in Haiti at the local level and that it should be driven by the local people. It should be a decentralized dialogue. Like um, It can't just be a national dialogue. It have, the national dialogue should start locally and build up. And we should help the youth also become better educated and understand their role in, in really um, having that vision of the potential of Haiti of, of, um, and include them in that work in defining what they really want from Haiti 20 years from now and from that vision, then work backward to what we should be doing in Haiti today. But if we want to help the youth, we also need a youthful approach. We cannot just say that we're going to help them with a, the term, for example, national dialogue would scare them because it means it's political. We don't want that. We want maybe to call it a conversation, like you're saying, not a dialogue. We want to say that it's youth encounters. We want to say that there will be no exclusion. We want everyone to sit on a dialogue table. We want the people from, you know, the, the local people and, and at different levels and the young entrepreneurs and the ones that are clearly representing the private sector and the others that are representing the associations. Um, we might, for example, do something that they like, which is do competition, have project competition, local project competition, have them compete one region against the other or one city against the other for who, for example, would have a better or the best water system or whatever that they all need in Haiti today. And we should be careful of not promoting exclusion. Um, being inclusive is not easy in Haiti, um, and oftentimes we feel that the international community is not really respecting the sovereign state of Haiti. 
and Haitians are very um, proud of being the first black republic. And we can't take that out of them. We would take their pride out if we do that. So we also need to have ambitious projects. When we really think about Haiti today, after the earthquake, we know that there is a 500,000 gap 500 houses, 500,000 houses gap that need to be built all around the country. If we had like 500 projects of 1,000 houses that would help build the country. And I often, when I think about Haiti, remember that Haiti in the Taino language, Haiti, meant small villages also. So 500 Haitis would be 500 small villages that we could build. That's just an example of something that could be done. And we need to more and more tell Haitian, and the report is saying that, that they have a jewel of a country that has been preserved and is still a pristine land that has a lot of potential. It's a very young country, um, a country with 75% of the population that is under 30. To sum up, let me give you a story that I remember. Um, and it's the story about a king who wanted to have a beautiful vase, the most beautiful vase there was. So he ordered the vase from one if, of the ceramic um, manufacturer who was very well known and told him, I want the most beautiful vase you've ever made. So the guy started working, brought the first one. The king said, no, it's not that they brought. Second, he said, no, 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 it's still not that. That's not what I want. So the guy tried like 10 times, 50 times. When he got to the 100, he brought like the most beautiful base and he brought it to the king. And the king said, it's really beautiful, but it's, not, it's still not what I want. Still something is missing. Go back. So he took the vase, went back home, and frustrated, he broke the vase. You know, looked at the table, looked at it on, on, on the floor and started crying. And then he really had a lot of regrets about breaking the vase. <laughs> so he said, well, let me try to piece it together. And he started piecing it together, but using silver linings and gold lining, and he pieced it all together. And it took him three, four months to really put the vase back together. And then he realized maybe it's the king will accept that. So he brought it to the king, and the king said, ah, finally, the most beautiful vase. It's perfect because it's not perfect. That's Haiti for me today. That's what we need to do if we, can, if we really want to help Haiti. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jocelyn, leader of the Haitian diaspora and <laughs> human rights activist and many things, how do you, how do you see this? Um, First of all, I, w I would be very ambitious f for me to say that I'm the leader of the Haitian diaspora. Um, I'm just one of the many people who have, for the time, for quite a number of years, uh, been involved in trying to deal with Haiti and trying to push the policies forward, particularly with respect to U.S. policies towards Haiti. Um, this said, let me let me begin by thanking Claire and Joanna and 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 everybody else around the table for the opportunity to speak on this report that has been drafted as a subject of conversation. Uh, hopefully it's going to be one of many conversations that are going to happen around Haiti. And let me readily agree that, you know, uh, uh, and, and this is part of the reason why I've been involved in Haiti and, and the struggle for, for a new Haiti for quite a number of years, is because I think that Haiti has had has a lot of potential um, despite you know all the the, the rough and tumble of, of its politics, of its uh, uh, missed opportunities and so on, but it remains one of the countries in which I think that if given half a chance, um, that it would um, uh, really um, uh, impress um, uh, and perhaps in, uh, be able to, to uh, surpass some of its Caribbean neighbors. Um, 
So that's to begin with. Uh, uh, secondly, I think that you know, we should not underestimate the kind of work that needs to happen uh, with respect to Haiti. Um, I think there are some, uh, if, if you go into the report and, and go deeply into the report, uh, you'll find that there are many things that you can agree with. Um, if we are not in the business of managing crisis, uh, if we're in the business of making sure that crisis go away and that the the uh, um, that people who are supposed to benefit from the resolution of this crisis do in fact benefit from it, then we realize that we need to put ourselves out of business at the same time. Um, so to a certain extent, yes, putting the emphasis on Haitians being front and center and being the leading um, entity that is going to make uh, to take us forward is is in my view appropriate and I don't think anybody can disagree with that now this said let me say a couple of things um, I think it is wrong to say um, that uh, that there has never been a national conversation or a national dialogue uh, in Haiti there have been lots and lots of national conversation and national dialogues um, they have not they have had very short-term uh, goals and objectives. Um, I can say, for example, the more one of the more recent uh, effort of a, at a national dialogue was the effort that was made in 2002-2003 um, uh, by a group that called itself the Group of 187, um, and <clears throat> they went around around the country having conversations about what a new social covenant uh, should be with respect to Haiti. Now. Part of, part of the agenda was how do we get rid of the current government. Um, and once the government uh, then was gotten rid of, the dialogue ended. Um, so to me, there is, there is a, 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 a caution uh, with respect to when, when people are calling for a national dialogue. I would say that there has been also a national dialogue before that. And the national dialogue resulted, in fact, in the, in the adoption of a set of principles, the set of principles that were consecrated in the Haitian Constitution of 1987. So there you, had, you had dialogue among Haitians, and they came up with a, a series of, of, of ideas of how they were going to manage this country, how they were going to prevent the market, I mean, the dictatorship from coming back, how they were going to uh, agree to applying you know, all the principles of democratic progress, including universal uh, uh, support for education, um, uh, health care, and, and, and so on and so forth. None of that happened um, because the, another conversation that, that should have been held was not held, um, and that conversation had to be held not only by Haitians themselves, but also by everybody involved, every, every stakeholder involved. So to some extent, what we need to do is to have a transnational dialogue. Haiti is no longer an island into itself or a nation into itself. It is, it, it is as we know, overly dependent on international assistance. It is overly dependent on remittances from the Haitian diaspora. Um, it is overly dependent on the, the same time, this is, this is a, 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 a support to Haiti that undermines the capacity of Haitians themselves to build a strong foothold in the United States, for example, or in Canada or elsewhere, because to some extent, they cannot accumulate enough capital in order to be able to, 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 to in fact, be much more helpful to Haiti. And Haiti does not necessarily um, uh, accept them wholeheartedly. Um, Haiti, um, uh, I mean, Haitians from abroad are seen as competitive, competitors to those who are inside of, of the country. Um, <coughs> and to some extent, the same relationship that Haitians in Haiti have with the generic blanc uh, uh, abroad you know, uh, applies to the Haitian diaspora itself. In other words, I come to Haiti, and uh, there is a dollar sign on my head. I mean, there is no doubt about it in my mind, and, and, and that's a relationship that makes it uneasy or poor with, with your Haitian brothers and, and sisters. Now, this said, let me, let me address another thing. Um, what I think needs to happen, yes, a national dialogue, a national conversation, a transnational conversation needs to happen, but it's not going to be, it's not going to be, it cannot be limited to how do we, ha from, from this point on to the next election. In fact, it should not be tied to the next election. It should be tied to the issue of what is going to be Haiti you know, in the next 10, 15, or 20 years from now as, as, um, 
as uh, Hans has, has said. Um, and, and, and part of that dialogue has to address the issue of what the playbook has been. The playbook, as far as I'm concerned, was adopted, yeah, uh, let's say for, for argument's sake, about 50 years ago. Um, and that playbook is the following. A Haiti has been taken over by a dictator you know, who essentially privatized state agencies to his own benefit. Um, and to the effort of his, of his loyal supporters and so on. The playbook was, we are not going to, to fund the government. We are not going to tie ourselves and our hands with the government because of the dictatorship. And so we are going to channel you know, international aid um, uh, through international NGOs that we can rely on, that we can control, and so on and so forth. Um, so the, 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 the playbook said, we... Uh, we don't want the government co to completely collapse because, frankly, you know, if it if it collapses, you're going to have, and we have had, you know, waves and waves after wave of migration and refugees and 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 all the concerns that have been that have been expressed and the policies that that have evolved from it. Um, but we are not going to sustain it. Um, now, that paradigm could have um, uh, changed in 1994. Um, when um, and President Clinton decided that he was going to put the weight of the United States um, uh, behind an effort at democratic progress and essentially took a stand against military rule, um, helped kick out the military rulers at the time, and restored President Aristide to power. Um, that paradigm could have changed that time. It did not change uh, for a variety of reasons that we can you know, some of you, you know, who have been involved in this effort can, can easily see and, and can comment on afterwards. But what happened here is that the playbook still remained the same. We continue, the international community continued to channel its assistance through um, international NGOs. Um, Government of Haiti continues to be you know, sort of a, an, an easy partner in in, in chaperoning democracy and so on and so forth, and we cannot rely on it. And that has happened despite all the attention and despite the increasing um, um, acknowledgement of, of Haiti. So my sense here is that you know, a dialogue needs to happen. It cannot be led by the government of Haiti because there is a deep mistrust of the government of Haiti. Or it has to be led by a party that is seen to be neutral or at least impartial um, to that. I mean, in the past, uh, the church, the Catholic Church, has been used as a as a tool, as an instrument, uh, to get that dialogue. That might be that might be a possibility, or you could have at least you know several people from different sectors, you know, who are, who have earned their respect over time to be part of this process. But as I said, the the, the dialogue should not be simply a dialogue among Haitians uh, in Haiti. It has to be a transnational dialogue. I have been involved in some of these dialogues among political parties. The, uh, as frankly, at this point, the political parties exist in name only. They don't exist in reality. They are fractured. They are one-man shows, m mostly. Or if they're not one-man shows, they are a few people who can rally you know, a few thousand people once in a while uh, to demonstrate that they have some muscles to flex. But frankly, uh, uh, past the objective that has been sought, they don't, they don't go uh, any further. Um, Finally, I think that, that, that in the, the dialogue is not going to be done overnight. Results are not going to be taking place overnight. It's going to take some time. In the meantime, what do you do? What do you do, as far as I'm concerned, is to make sure that you continue to build the infrastructure, the social and economic infrastructure that is going to prime Haiti you know, for this spring forward. And that means, yes, continuing to focus on road building, electricity, building up the, the electrical grid, and so on. Um, continuing, but mostly, for example, continuing to invest, invest substantially using the internet or Twitter and so on and so forth, and, and God knows what's going to happen in the next 10, 15 years uh, um, with respect to the possibilities, then you need to make sure that the people who are going to be involved do have the basis to get involved. Um, I, can so I could say far more than, than this. Um, I'm going to stop there and hopefully uh, that my uh, remarks have been, a, have been a contribution to this effort. 
Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, before I throw it open to the room, I just want to uh, give Ann an opportunity if she wants to make any comments or questions to raise with them. I, I really, I have a question for whichever members of the panel feel like answering it. Um, I think, Jocelyn, you alluded to this actually in the last part of what you were saying. I'd like to know what, and this is, a, and, I, and I speak as an outsider, but who's watched some of these processes in other countries, what would or could or should kickstart this process? I mean, is it the Catholic Church? Is it, you know, Hans, is it your organization and organizations like it? If there was going to be a new kind of discussion, where should it take place? I, I, want, it, I want some sense of practicalities. I wonder if Claire could talk about experience in other countries where this kind of process has, has, has been successful. Can, 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 you, can I ask you to be sort of practical about it just for a minute, each of you? Or, or not each of you, whoever wants to say anything. <laughs> well, I, I think that anyone could, I mean, not anyone, but yes, the church could start it. Yes, uh, my organization, we could do it. We don't have to do it alone. Though. We can do it together with the church, and we can have the sponsoring of the presidency. Or, I mean, it can be, and if we put it that outside and say that it's for the youth, and, and, and we don't even talk too much about the political side of it. And we say it's a project for the youth in who, for them to understand that in 20 years um, that will be their country. Um, I think anyone could start it, really. It's just a question though, of having the financing. Who's going to back the whole process and how are they going to feel that it's not just a conversation, but that it would then result in yeah, some how do you, projects. How do you give it some national status? A university. I'm going to say, Claire. Actually, let me tell you something. I just I know that we just have a new minister of education, that is a very good friend of mine, and I'm sure that if I go to him and tell him why don't we start the dialogue at the high school level, we could do that. And in 20 years, those 18 years will be 38, and there will be it will be their turn to really be. Um, you know, at, uh, 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 managing the country. So maybe the school system would be a good place to also start. We've had success working with schools in Haiti also, and and they, it's really an age where they they feel you know they since they're not out yet they still are dreaming, and we want them to dream and but also have them understand that they that from their work you know something meaningful will come up. It's a, comment. It's, it's a great question, and it's especially I find p particularly t timely because one of the things that we've studied is that in many countries, um, there's often an agreement among many key constituencies that such a conversational dialogue is needed, but then it doesn't happen precisely because this practical question of who should start it and how should it move never gets agreed upon. Um, and we've seen this happen many, many times. Um, I think also, though, and, and something I think that both Hans and Justin very helpfully um, illustrated for us, it's also happening every day. It's happening in households, it's happening in probably in schools, it's happening in a distributed way. So it's not that there aren't conversations going on, it's a question of how does it um, gain a traction and really feed into the policy process. Um, if we've looked at ex examples around the world, I think it can also take many different forms, as, as Johanna al alluded to. Uh, Many of you may be aware that an, a national d dialogue, a formal process, has just concluded in Yemen, for example. But that had a, it was a formal process with a set number of delegates who stayed sort of locked up together for a set period of months and so on. Um, other countries, and for example, and there's no comparison between Haiti and Afghanistan, but for example, at the moment, there is a national conversation happening in Afghanistan, but it happens to be happening in rallies and linked to a political <coughs> process. Um, in other countries, it's been very apolitical. It hasn't been um, linked to the electoral process, and one example of that, in my mind, would be the Montfleur uh, <coughs> process in, in South Africa, yeah. which was a facilitation of different scenarios yeah. for the future that involved many different stakeholders to try and amalgamate uh, different views. So these are some of the examples, and other places it's happened more, more organically, and, and Anne, as the historian, yeah. would <laughs> be able to, w you know, when, when does a, a country reach a juncture where the conversation just starts, starts happening organically. Just as a historical footnote, in Haiti, after Aristide <laughs> was returned, 
um, I was with the Office of Transition Initiative, and we brought leaders of the South African Peace Dialogue to Haiti. And we brought them all around the country, and it was really very effective in setting up some of these community development programs because they had been fresh from the experience in their own country. And, you know, like other things, it was tried and dropped. But indeed, uh, the one question I have about the church, and I raise it as a question, is that Haiti has a large number of non Catholic Pentecostal religions. So, to the extent that in smaller communities, <coughs> would they provide the legitimacy that at a political level may be very effective nationally, a church could do it? One suggestion that had come in to my mind when and I was thinking this was such a great question to ask because universities are also a very good place to start in that they're not perceived as political entities. They're truly the institutions of education in Haiti. Well, I think it could be a, could be a combination of church leaders, both Catholic and non-Catholic church leaders. Um, and, and the real criteria has to be whether or not any one of the individuals identified with spearheading this, uh, this, this effort have the credibility and, and are seen to be as impartial. In other words, part of the reason why you want to go to the church is because to some extent they're supposed to respond to a higher authority you know, which is not of this earth. Um, and, and that's where you start. Now, um, with respect to, to others, um, part of the problem has always been you know, whether or not, you know, as, as I mentioned, whether or not you know, do you have sufficient funding uh, which is going to provide for that kind of a dialogue over the, the not the short term, but at the very least the midterm and, 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 and eventually the long term. And my sense here is that the dialogue that needs to take place, there's also another dialogue that needs to take place among the funders uh, and the donor countries, which may not necessarily have, have taken place, is the fact that how do we, how do you respond to Haiti? When do you, res when do you pull back? When do you change? And so on. I mean, I, I, I know there is a, for example, and there's a hope that eventually the, uh, uh, the UN peacekeeping presence is going to end in Haiti because to some extent I mean, it's never, it has never been the case of Haiti having to, to uh, divide up two warring uh, factions um, and, and, and so on. But um, back in 2004, I remember um, Kofi Annan, Basically saying, well, we're gonna probably gonna be there for about 20 years. Yeah. Now it's been 10 years already, um, and uh, so uh, is Venusta going to be there for another 10 years or less? I mean, that's one of the questions that needs to be addressed by the international community itself. Okay, thank you. Um, we're gonna open it up to questions now. Um, I think we'll take three or four questions. I'm gonna ask you to be patient and speak into the microphone because we are broadcasting this on the web and we'll post a, the uh, video later. So if you would, I have a question here. Uh, Angela, you have a question right there. Why don't you just start right there uh, and then come down here and then we'll catch two here in the middle and then we'll have time for, we have plenty of time for a second round, third round. Thank you. My name is Alejandro Sanchez. I'm a senior fellow at the Council of Hemispheric Affairs here in DuPont Circle. Uh, when talking about uh, foreign investment and Haitian ownership, I guess if we want to talk about concrete examples, I need to mention the Marriott Hotel that's being built in Port au Prince. Uh, 200 jobs, $45 million. It's owned by the Marriott, the Digital Group, and the Clinton Foundation was also involved. It's supposed to be open in 2015. I'm wondering what is the mood like in Haiti is there excitement about this project? Um, is there a sense of, like you said, Haitian ownership? Or is this more like just a foreign company trying to just exploit ma manual labor? I'm just wondering what the, what the mood is like. And my second question, as, as a really quick follow-up, when discussing the future of um, Haitian internal security, is the, I guess I would like to ask especially the, the, our, the, the Haitians here in, in the panel, please, do you believe that MINUSTA should end in 2014? Do you believe, like as was mentioned before, that Haiti can uh, control its own borders, can, uh, can protect some citizens? Thank you. Angela, we have a question up here, if you don't mind. I want to just recognize my colleagues from the Wilson Center. Angela Bodinsky is our research assistant. Christine Sano in the back as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Yes. Patricia Fagan, Georgetown University. Uh, it, the crisis created by the earthquake was tragic. It was horrible. It was as bad as it could have been. But 
that said, it opened up a possible opportunity for future development, which was unfortunately quickly closed thanks to the fact that the donors largely fell into what you all have identified as a crisis trap. Therefore, I congratulate you on doing this report and on what went behind it. Let me, and, and forgive me, that I do have a question, a specific question, and I'll be as very brief as possible in, in, in explaining the background to the question. I'll try to do it in one sentence. When the earthquake occurred, hundreds of thousands of Haitians left Port-au-Prince, as they had to. They went all over the place. Mostly, they went to the places of origin from which they or their parents had come, which was in the interior <coughs> of Haiti. Did the donors pay any attention or any uh, sufficient attention to the needs of all of those receiving communities. On the contrary, they did not. And therefore, the people in those, those in, this would have been an opportunity to spearhead which would, might, something that might have been the future development of a more decentralized Haiti without two th a third of the country living in Port-au-Prince, as is currently the case. The contrary happened. Since very little aid went to these villages, most of the people either left for other places across, crossing international borders or went back to Port-au-Prince. The ultimate result, according to the IOM statistics, is that the population of Port-au-Prince has grown, not receded, as a result of the earthquake. This is not a good outcome. Um, I was, I'm, I've just thumbed through the report. I couldn't have read it all very fast. But my question, but, uh, well, I noticed there's one, rec one of the recommendations is to invest across the whole country. Bravo, that's a really good recommendation. However, the way it's stated is as if there, was, there are two choices. One is to let everything stay in Port-au-Prince, which is the urban, the center, or else invest in agriculture. I think this is wholly inadequate. Much better is this part of the, another part of the report that talks about poles of development in other parts of Haiti. Therefore, I would like the people on the panel to comment on how you see regional development as being furthered as part of this process. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and we had two gentlemen here in the middle, one on the left, one on the right, uh, and then we'll, we'll take another round in a minute, let our panelists. Yes, sir. Can you identify yourself? Yes, My name is Jean-Marie Jean-Pierre. Uh, I am from Haiti, working for NASA here. And um, I really feel that what we need to do for Haiti is we need to come up with new ideas. Most of the people that have been proposing recommendations to solve the Haiti problem have been the same people, their friends, their family. They never get people like the young Haitian people come to this country. I, I wrote a dissertation on Haiti, U.S. policy toward Haiti. 1991, 1994. So I made a lot of recommendations. So as an Haitian, so I, I taught at John Hopkins University, lecture at Howard University, worked for NASA 16 years. But those of us who've been here, educated here, understand the American political system, could take some of the things that we learn here in this country, <coughs> apply them to Haiti. We have never given an opportunity to come to Haiti and do something. Because again, the diaspora is not seen as an, as an asset. It's seen as a, you know, as a competition, like Mr. Justin talked about earlier. I think we need new ideas. We need the basic thing. We talk about investing in Haiti. There are some basic things that need to take place first before we attract the people, the infrastructure, both political, economic, and social have to be put in place. The Haitian people have to be empowered. We also need to, uh, to address the problem of the predatory state that have been one of the characteristics of Haiti, where most of the politicians think the private, the private finance should be in twin with the public finance of the country. So if you cannot attack, tackle those issues, no matter what we talk about, it's been the same thing we've been talking about over and over and over again. It is time to also target some other folks. The diaspora, those people who've been studying, go to all the universities, learning about how government work. The basic thing about bureaucracy. Bureaucracy in hate is an impediment to even the way that we do business. I'm hoping that as we're trying to address the Haitian problem, so we can think about all the many thousand Haitian like me who came to this country not even knowing English, nothing, no pool, and then having a PhD, having MBAs. We can go back to our country and help. But the infrastructure, 
the opportunity must be put in place where the Haitian people can work as one. Because the biggest problem, we're very divided mm -hmm. as a country, and then most of the people who are in a position to make a difference are very self-centered, and it's time for us to address those issues before we address some other things. Because we have Thank to you. empower the Haitian people, both inside and outside the country, to address the problem that have been plagued Haiti for centuries, I would say. Thank, Thank you. you. Would you do me a favor and just hand the microphone over to the gentleman behind you? There you go. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Mark Alain Busico. I am Haitian. <clears throat> I was born and raised in Haiti. I recently moved to Washington because I got a Fulbright scholarship. And I came and I'm actually doing my master's at American University. Great. I'm happy Great. To, to have Joanna here speaking. Um, I, mean, I would like to follow up on, you, on, on the point of my colleague here and insist on, on three things that actually it, you know, came to my mind after I heard this presentation. One is communication connection. Mm -hmm. Two is, of course, youth. OK, youth. And the third thing is about decentralization. Um, everybody is saying that Haiti needs to, to be empowered and things need to happen in a decentralized way. However, whenever anyone is thinking about initiatives to, in, in Haiti, they go to the same people. They centralize their action. So it's hard to have decentralized results if actions are actually centralized. And I also work for the Inter American Development Bank, and I worked for them in Haiti for three years. And I, I've, I, there is a lot of personal willingness about how to make things happen. And a lot of people have great ideas. But it's just that the system is actually shaped in a way that it always goes in the same direction. So any type of energy that is put in is driven exactly somewhere. It's like a system that is working this way. And my personal opinion on this is actually youth, because I really, really believe in the power of youth. And I've been able to, to, to actually have such an experience because I had the chance to travel and participate in youth conferences. Again, through the IDB, which is also a great channel. And I've been in, in, in a lot of conferences in Latin America where actually there's ideas of young leaders coming together to think about the issues, having discussions, dialogues, but also target themselves into results. Like, we, we don't want just to to communicate just to discuss what the issues are. And again, that's the problem I think that happened with the, with the 186 thing. It was targeted into something. If discussions are not targeted into something, they easily fit out once another opportunity comes up. So these guys, you know, they gather together and then they, they come up with ideas and then they go back to their country, they work on, uh, on making a chance and they actually do make a chance in their country. And me personally as a Haitian, I had a personal experience. I approached them and I said, I wanted to do something like that in Haiti, where everybody would just gather, not just to discuss Haiti, we've been discussing Haiti, but to target into action what we can do. What happened, we went through a partnership, but then again, there's another channel that comes back in. And in the end, we had to stop this relationship because again, I think personally what happened was like personal interest came in again from the international community as well. So what I saw, I saw result. I saw young people getting together. But what they saw was a, p a platform, mm -hmm. political, money. They also saw that too. So what happened is I was driving discussion in a direction with a willingness to do something. But the people I was partnering with were seeing it in a very different way. And then they think we're young and we're innocent and we don't understand. And that's not true. And my final call is going to be on youth. And, and I actually really appreciate the work that Ans is doing in Haiti. It's actually very, very well seen. Um, but I think personally, as I'm 26 years old. And since I was 22, I felt like I fell into a gap where when people are talking about young people in Haiti, and again, I'm repeating a, a, a Ashoka fellow who wrote an article recently about this, young Haitians are seen as a problem. They need education. They need this. They need that. They need to get a job. So there are an issue that needs to be solved, and let's think about how they, we can solve that. Whereas I didn't feel, oh, I'm sorry, maybe I'm too long. Yeah, I, 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 I didn't feel. I just want to give other people an opportunity here as well. Yes. Thank you. Again, yes. And, and, and then uh, I'm just going to finish this with this. Young people are, are not seen as 
opportunity creators, that they can actually come together and create opportunity. They're not a problem that needs to be solved. We don't want to, to learn how to, how to make a movie. I mean, I like the example, but that's not just that. There are young people also that are between 23 and 30 years old that are very capable, that work in international organization, that have power, that are from the diaspora. We can do a little bit more than that. Okay, thank you very much. I think there's a lot of good ideas and questions there. Let's give our panelists an opportunity to respond to several of these. Um, Hans, you want to you know, raise the issue of the, the Marriott project, um, regional development, um, the role of youth, new ideas from new actors. Minusta, yeah. take your pick. <laughs> okay, let me start with the Marriott. Um, I think it's a wonderful project, but we, most people also know that it's a project to um, house the Digicel employees. And a lot of Haitians will be very proud to have a Marriott there, um, but I'm sure that they know also that they will not be staying at the Marriott, and it's mostly for the Blancs. So we, we, but we do know that we need infrastructures and that we need hotels like that, and that we would need them all over the place, not just... In, not just in Port-au-Prince and not just for the DigiCell employees mainly, I mean mostly, but I'm not. Um, then Minusta. Um, definitely I think that the Minusta should live in a year or two. Um, we have to remember that Haiti was a country created by an army. Um, right now our president is not feeling very good because he does not have an army. and and. What he says is, and, and what everyone say in Haiti, is that Haiti without an army is not completely Haiti, since it was created by generals who really fought, and they like their weapons. A lot of people in Haiti, what they really like about being, um, uh, say, autorité or zotobré, whatever, big, big guy in Haiti is having the weapon. So... <laughs> <laughs> That's true, it and, and, and it's funny because I remember a few years ago there was a guy that was a secu <laughs> security guard at a house, and, and there was a thief that went into the house. So I said, how come you let that happen? He said, I would have killed him. I have my weapon, but I didn't have bullets in the weapon. So it's just the weapon that is important. It's not even the bullet. You know? mm -hmm. um, but we, I think that Minister definitely need to transform we do still need the technical assistance. We need them to continue training the police. Um, but I don't see really what they've been doing around the country as far as the military part. I, I don't think it has made a big difference. Yes, some, I mean, Preval really like the fact that, he, you know, with the minister, then, then if anything happens in Haiti today, um, I think it, it I think that's how Preval maybe thought um, that it would not be his responsibility if anything happened in the country because there is an international force that is supposed to protect us. Um, so that's kind of taking responsibility off the, the, the leadership in Haiti when we have an army. I don't think that we really need it, and I think that um, definitely we need to move out of it. John and Claire, would you like to talk about this issue that Pat raised about regional development and, and decentralization and so on? Do you start that? Or I can show Either one. Doesn't. Um, and, and first, actually, on the question of new ideas and young people, this is something we heard about a lot in the course of our consultations, and I hope we've reflected that spirit, that this paper is meant to be a humble offering to help catalyze that kind of new conversation and seek to engage with new new voices, very much recognizing that the center of gravity of the country, just because of the demographics, is shifting towards the youth, and also that the youth are a tremendous asset and contributor, net contributor to society, not, not just a challenge. Um, so um, having said that, the question of, I think, education is still important. 
um, in so many crisis response and so so-called development initiatives. There's such a focus on primary education, and I think nobody should argue against primary education. It's foundational. It's very important. But we've seen in so many places around the world that 90, 100 percent of the resources go to primary education, and then nothing's done for the teenagers, um, the late teens, the early 20s, and not just sort of abstract tertiary education from another century, but really how do you gear that higher education system to the practical, relevant, specific needs of the society, both the public sector and the private sector. And creating that kind of gearing or matching system is something that every, you know, California is struggling with this. It's not a question of the developing countries al alone. Um, on the question of, an, an excellent question as well, on the question of concentration in the capital city, uh, terribly important question. I think that then sort of two ways that we've looked at it. One is looking at support to other urban areas and, and seeking to balance, um, including opening up other ports so that Porto Prince isn't the, the bottleneck and the logjam and the only um, entry point in, in, into and out of the country, um, but also the importance of the rural areas and absolutely not just agriculture, but um, whether one takes an integrated rural development approach or looks at specific sectors. And this is where... Um, and also the question of decentralization. I think, how do you move away from, it's not all about decentralization or all decentralization, but the question of which function should be addressed at which level. You know, some things you do want covered in the capital city, like the money supply <laughs> and, the, and the, the decisions on the use of force, but some things you do want to be decentralized to the urban level or the community level. And finding the right framework that's right for Haiti seems to be the critical issue. And then the question, sort of what are the mechanisms then for programming of development? And what we've seen in other countries, one is the importance, sometimes the use of having a trust fund so that donors don't have to choose between very micromanaged projects on the one hand or the blank check of budget support on the other hand. How do you have a kind of hybrid mechanism and trust funds have sometimes proven very useful. Didn't work in South Sudan, but actually proved very useful in Afghanistan where you have, as Johanna mentioned, that dual key system that um, the, the money can come in to the government's priorities, to their programs, but the money's only released after certain accountabilities are met and audits are given, and that's one way of doing that. And then the kind of programs that do reach across the country to particularly the community level, um, whether it's to individuals or to communities or groups of communities. And some of the programs we've seen that work in other countries, the, the Magdalena Media Program in Colombia that many of you may know, which was the collaboration, of course, between the church, the communities, and business. The National Solidarity Program in Afghanistan gave block grants directly to 31,000 villages and is still going. The villages themselves have their own bank account and they decide they implement. The same pro type of program was used in Indonesia, now in 80,000 villages. And it cuts out all those middlemen of the UN agencies and the NGOs. The NGOs still have a role, but it's a different one. And I think those, that type of programming approach may have um, some relevance. And I'll do a quick comment um, on, on Haiti's army. Of, you know, and, and Haiti may in the future decide that it does need an army, but of course, what are the basics? Is, is, is it going to be able to afford it? So unless the revenue starts coming in, yeah. um, it's, it's, it's a, if, if Haiti has the revenue collection. You need a national guard, at least, yeah, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. but, uh, yeah. I, I just, oh, yeah, just want to say, I, 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 I demobilized yeah, demobilize the army, as oh, no. not <laughs> individually, but creating the plan. <laughs> so so I, I think at the time it was a good decision. The one thing that people don't know about the Haitian army, because there was a paramilitary, otherwise known as the Toto Makut, who worked uh, in contra to the army, is that the army was educated. You had to have a high school degree to be a soldier in Haiti. And that was one of the most interesting findings. So you had an educated class of soldiers who, after uh, the army was demobilized, we sadly did not do enough to be able to integrate these individuals who had skills into society. And the biggest complaint, because we did a survey at the time, was that they were put back into the formal sector, went across the border, and also had access to weapons. And that's another story. So. Whether Haiti has a National Guard or whether, and, and it has a police, it has to be able to pay for them, as Claire said. But I wanted to say decentralization, which is extremely important and to some extent has been successful in the creation of the Caracol uh, factory complex in the northeast of Haiti, needs to be part of a conversation because not only do you have to decentralize, but you also have to have things that people can do when you decentralize. And that's also financial. There were programs that gave, which were similar to the National Solidarity Program in Haiti that were cut off by USAID. And that did give the, uh, the decision making to the local mayors and the community councils as to how they would spend it. I don't know the rationale behind cutting those off, but those need to be returned. Also, the, at the federal level at Haiti, 
uh, there is not decentralization to the, the nine departments. So you don't even have people who have resources to pay out to make these things happen. And that creates the vicious cycle of donor dependency and external support rather than local decision making. Um, so one last point on the diaspora, uh, and that is there has always been talk of creating plants to make it easier for diaspora to return to create and build the skills that people have learned in the United States and Canada and France and other countries back into Haiti. That has always been great in terms of talk, but not in terms of resources. If donors were to put money somewhere, it would be to create opportunities similar to reverse Fulbrights or other opportunities that would allow the tremendous talent of the Haitian diaspora to contribute. Because I know the will is there. We've heard two individuals, and I can't say any meeting I go to has this. And also legislatively, to be able to give uh, sort of immigration reform type legislation to allow people to come back for a certain amount of time without compromising their status on the line to become a citizen. Jocelyn, would you like to Yeah, add just something very here? briefly a couple of things. Um, one on the question of, of um, Minusta. Um, I think that one of the things that we all, we all need to I mean, really agree on is that part of the reason why Minusta is in Haiti is because Haiti is a trust territory of the United Nations, even if it's not in name. And part of the reason why I'm raising this is because, to some extent, I mean, the, the, the conversation has been that, well, I mean, the Haitians have not, are not meeting up the, the, the objectives that have been set for them or that they've agreed to and so on and so forth. But very rarely has the international community said that we are part of the problem, we are, we are part of the problem that, that has taken place. So my sense here, and, and, and I've said that a long time ago, that to some extent it is a partnership that has been established you know, um, uh, wrongly or, 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 or not uh, since 2004, and to a certain extent both parties need to step up to their plate and both parties need to say, you know, this is what we're going to do and we're going to be held responsible for the outcome. Uh, in, in this sense. So that's one thing. The second thing I would say is that, I mean, the government of Haiti, you know, which, uh, I mean, President Mount Haley, when he came into office and set up his government, essentially said, you know, we want, we're going to proclaim that Haiti is open for business. And, 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 in, and the open for business uh, strategy is, is essentially, in my mind, uh, a trickle down economic strategy. In other words, you know, let's try to get as much capital, big capital investors as possible, and this, therefore that's why you see Marriott and, and others who are coming into the country and building hotels, um, and, and, and make tourism, for example, you know, one of the, the elements that are going to be spearheading the development the, of the economy, whereas, well, the, 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 the model of, of, of uh, tourism that is being um, uh, proposed for Haiti is the w all in one tourism model, which is essentially follows from the path of the Labadee uh, model and so on. So, and the Ilavash is not going to be that much different from the Labadee uh, effort. Whereas, to me, that undermines all the wealth and riches you know, that Haiti provides and can provide to huge numbers of travelers. So, so, so to a certain extent, it's not going to be something that is going to be providing jobs, providing uh, resources, providing sustenance to the people of Haiti uh, who can then be involved regionally, regionally in, in the effort to build up the economy in the region. Um, so that's, those are the kind of two things that I wanted to mention in this regard. Can Hans? I add something for my two young friends? Yes, 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 of course, of course. <laughs> because We're going to start the national before, dialogue right here and now. Exactly. Definitely, I mean, definitely, definitely you'd have no start. problem starting a national dialogue because in the, when you get two Haitians in the room, they all have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> they won't give up the floor. They say Haitians are like Italians. When two Italians meet, they create a football team. When three meet, they create a political party. So that's <laughs> <laughs> said about polls um, as well, so it's an international problem. <laughs> um, but... About empowering the, the diaspora, um, I think that the, a lot of time when I speak to people from the diaspora, I could consider myself sometimes diaspora also actually, um, having lived both in Haiti and, and going back and forth for a long time. <coughs> um, but I think a lot, a lot of time the diaspora is missing the point. Don't come and tell us about our problems. And I remember President Martelly once saying, telling a young, intelligent guy, 
Why are you bringing me problems? Bring me solutions, give me alternatives, and I will make a choice. So I, I think that's how the diaspora should look at it. You know, what can we really bring to Haiti? Don't come and tell me that the, the, the infrastructure has to be fixed before I come back. Who's going to fix infrastructure? It has to be some engineer. I'm sure that in the United States, when they built all those beautiful buildings and roads and systems, they didn't go and ask for some diaspora to come and do it. They did it themselves, and, and they built it. So it's the same thing. We now are lucky, I think, of having a big diaspora that is a very educated diaspora, but who are afraid of going back to Haiti saying, well, when are we going to go back? You know, we, we want, there won't be running water. There won't be energy. There won't be, yeah, it's true. And, and, but you have to go through that to then build the country. And it's not true that we don't want your knowledge. Actually, we want the knowledge. But if you come just by yourself without a plan, just you know, talking about the problems, I'm sure that a lot of people will say, ah, it's because you're diaspora. And then you feel rejected. Mm -hmm. you know? So the other thing is about you know, the centralization, the, the fact that um, what Mark Anebusico was saying about trying to um, build something that is not um, taken by the same people in the private sector who, or whoever who wants to. It's true that it's a small society. It's also true that in Haiti we only have 6% um, of the population that is making more than $2,000 um, a month. So it's really a poor country. And it's a difficult country to really make it. Um, when you really look at most Haitian enterprises, I would say that they're under. Um, so how are you going to make it happen without them? And I think it's always a mistake also of thinking that we need to do our own thing without trying to get the help from the ones that are already on the land and know more or less the laws of the land. So. The process has to be how do we convince them to work with us. And I, I think that then you will get much more support. And when we talk about the 184 process, for example, what happened with the 184 is that we had that whole dialogue prepared, the whole contrat social. However, when La Torture came in, he didn't ask once what was the contrat social and how we could help with it. So, Obviously, it died because there was no real interest from the political class. And La Torture, actually, I can tell you that having been part of that process, we never thought that La Torture would become the prime minister. However, two years before that, I remember sitting, speaking to La Torture, who was in Haiti. We, were, we had a consulting firm and we were talking to him. And he was telling us, that the UN had asked him to come because maybe he would become the next prime minister. It was under Aristide, 2002. In 2004, he became the prime minister. And the minister came in, and he had told us at the time that probably there would be an in a, a big intervention of the UN in Haiti. We didn't know what it meant exactly. But Aristide left, and we got that. So the, like Josselin was saying, we need to understand today also how we Haitians want to solve the problems, but the international community has to sit with us, and we need to look at the same direction and understand that we all created that problem. Thank you. Okay, we have a few more questions. Uh, there's one here in the middle, uh, Christine, and then there's one uh, back, well, there's two more in the back, so we'll, uh, we'll take those two, those three, I'm sorry. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, it's on. Um, Peter Solis from the IDB, now a consultant with the IDB. Just three, three um, questions and for comment from the, uh, the panel. Um, the first one is um, maintenance. It's fine to build stuff, but we know that um, Haiti needs to maintain it. How do you um, instill a culture of maintenance in, into Haiti? Um, secondly, um, the gentleman here mentioned Haiti as a predatory state. How does Haiti become a, a state that provides public goods? I mean, in, in the sense that, um, what is it, 20% of primary education is produced by the public sector, um, about the same amount of, um, of health care. If you 
talk to my colleagues, Haitian colleagues, they have a generator, they don't depend upon EDH. They have a system for their water, they don't depend upon the, uh, the Dnepr or the uh, Port-au-Prince water system. So how do you, how do you get a sense that uh, the, the state should be delivering public goods or ensuring that public goods are being delivered? And thirdly, I, I didn't have a chance to finish reading the report, but I don't see anything on population growth. Um, I don't see very much on population growth. Uh, in the mid-1950s, people were talking about Haiti as an overcrowded country with three million. Um, by the mid-80s, it was five million. Now, what is it? Perhaps over 10, perhaps 11 million, 12 million. Mm -hmm. You know, I saw figures for, for, for um, uh, the growth of, of Cap Hachien. I think it was 25,000 in 1950, 125,000 in the mid-1970s. Now it's between half a million and eight, eight, 800,000. Population growth is both uh, an opportunity, but it also increases enormously the size of the problems that need to be addressed. So nobody, I, as I say, I, I've been looking for real um, discussion about population growth and policies on population growth, and I can't find anything. Great. There's a question right in the back and then one here on the right-hand side. Thank you. My name is Rick O'Sullivan, and I'm the uh, chair of Sid Washington's Civil Society Work Group. And so my question is about civil society. Uh, and then when you talk about institution building, and throughout the report you talk about institution building, but it's public sector, public sector, and public sector, uh, and no sense of, of balancing the public, private, and nonprofit sectors in the delivery of social services. Uh, and in terms of decentralization, has been raising, you know, how do you do that without changing? Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville in Democracy in America noted about the civil side here that they've decentralized out of the government completely into the, the, the nonprofit sector. Uh, and that's when we were an agricultural economy. The, so my question is, is, you know, what I've seen, not just in Haiti and elsewhere, but that the money floods in and you co-opt the civil society. As everyone noted, when the crisis first happened and the government was basically dysfunctional, trying to get itself back on its feet, it was the civil society, it was the nonprofit sector, primarily the Catholic Church, but uh, nonprofits who, who were doing the heavy lifting. And rather than saying, well, let's work with that resource, it's how do we shift away from that into the public sector when maybe you shouldn't be? You know, uh, so. What do you think we've learned from this experience in terms of empowering or, or co-opting the civil society that we can learn from, that we can take to the next crisis? And how do you get the civil society off the donor gravy train that's been established so that they can become more, ha have more local uh, control? Thank you. And then there was a uh, question there right there, Angela. And then if we can keep it short, we'll maybe get one or two more questions in at the end. Um, I'm Jim Byrne. I'm a longtime journalist here. And um, I'm very active in a Catholic parish in uh, Tacoma Park, which is the host of one of the three Haitian language masses every Sunday. And one of my dearest friends there, uh, who is from Haiti, uh, has said to me on many occasions, what we Haitians haven't learned is how to forgive each other. I'd be interested in every Haitian in this room's opinion on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, why don't we just start right down the row here. Uh, Claire, you want to lead us off? And uh, there's just a variety of questions. Maybe you want to take any one. Um, certainly. First on infrastructure and maintenance, really key question. In fact, the World Economic Forum has been leading a process and we've been playing part. I want to take an opportunity to acknowledge Andrea Yurosh who's been working on, on that with ISE and Linda Collins who played an enormously valuable role in the, in the research and preparation of this report. But in that whole process, absolutely key, they found two major constraints in infrastructure. One is the pipeline of feasibility projects in so many countries that pipeline isn't moving so that even if money is available the prepared projects aren't available and the second key constraint is when things are built the maintenance the culture of maintenance isn't in the budgets I think one issue is then building maintenance into the budgets the public budgets and the, and the donor budgets but as you say it's a matter of culture of maintenance it's not just a budgeting question um, 
on the predatory state as well, question of, of yes, how do you kick up this sense of this relationship between citizen and state centered around accountability? And you know, the, the revenues are never, you, you're never gonna persuade the public to, to, to increase revenues until they see real service delivery and that the money is being spent accountable, accountably. And so how, the, how do you turn from a vicious circle into a virtuous circle of accountability, I think is really at the heart of m so many of these questions of institutions. Um, I'll leave the question of demography to others. I think probably we may not have paid it enough attention. I suppose we were reflecting on the, the consequences of, a, of population growth given that they're very, very, very young population. So we touched on it. We may have, should have paid it more attention. Um, and then on the question of, of civil society, I think to me it's, it's very, very relevant in, in two ways, and, but I would make a distinction. Um, civil society is obviously a very broad term. Um, one component of it is the NGOs and their role in service delivery, and absolutely, in some of the successful national programs that we've seen around the world, is absolutely where the government sets policy, but helps partners with or contracts to both non-profit and for-profit organizations. Um, but more generally, the role of s civil society in terms of citizenship and the public, I think, is a different issue, and I th that's what we were trying to get at through the, uh, through the national dialogue question. Johanna, did you want to... Just um, one quick thing on uh, the institution building. I think in the section of the report where we deal with changing the way uh, we look at aid in Haiti has very much to do with the way the government interacts with civil society. We acknowledge that there need to be accountability mechanisms, but if the only presence of the state is not the state but the NGOs, which has been the ongoing problem in Haiti, then you have to be able to find a way to shift that. It's not going to be an overnight shift, but even by decentralization, something we talked about in the last round of questioning, you create s a sense of legitimacy in your decentralized institutions that can convey public goods to people, including the police, uh, uh, as part of that, the security. Then you begin to create the balance that I think is needed. and that creates a lesson that not only are the police in need of training, which of course they're getting right now, but the maintenance not only of roads, but of security institutions are going to be central because police can't be feared. They have to be part of the first presence of the state that any citizen has. And instilling that is going to be a long-term proposition. Uh, Hans or Jocelyn? Well, let me go first. because. Uh, a couple of things with respect to the question about trust among Haitians and whether or not um, Haitians have been are able to forgive themselves. I'm not sure. The, I, I'm not sure there's a question of forgiveness. I mean, there is a question of trust, um, uh, and there's a, a and trust has been built over years because there is deep disparity, economic disparity, and social disparity among Haitians. In other words, you know, if if I if I look at the, the people. Um, like me or look like me you know, in Haiti and port au prince I mean, we don't look like you know, people who are at the bottom of the rung. Um, and, and frankly, that physical uh, difference in the shows. Um, I'm much more healthy than a lot of other people who are not making a, a living uh, out of it. Uh, and to the extent that services are not provided to them, Poor services do not flow from them. They don't. They don't benefit from having portable water. They don't benefit from having decent housing. They don't benefit from having schools that can you know, educate their children or can educate them. They don't benefit from a number of uh, opportunities that are taken for granted here in the United States, for example. Then obviously there's not going to be a lot of trust um, when you are at the when you are at the mercy. You know, of a segment of society that essentially doesn't give a damn about you, then you're not going to trust that, and to some extent, there's going to be resentment, and thus clashes again and again and again and again. Um, so, so part of what needs to happen is really to to address the issue of the deficit of trust. Um, that's why, in my remarks initially, I said you know it would be wrong to think that the government itself could lead a national dialogue because the government is not trusted and uh, by the by the by overall society and even by those who profit from government relationship and so on and so forth to some extent i mean it's a it's a it's a very difficult relationship that happens um, two um, there is part of the uh, part of what needs to happen as well is that people are not you know, sort of I mean in the in the remote isolated communities people can relate to each other um, but let me say that in these communities there's hardly any government function there 
So when we're looking at strengthening government or, or, or building up the institution of government, building up the public sector, there's two things that need to happen. One is the fact that, yes, government needs to be built up by, by making sure that the people who run it um, are not there because they're the wives, lovers, uh, 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 and relatives of the people who have put in charge for, for the moment. I mean, the government has to be run by people who are competent, by civil servants who can do the job and get paid for doing the job a decent wage um, in, accordance, in accordance to, to Haitian standards. Um, that doesn't mean that they have to be paid millions and, or, or that, uh, for example, if you do bring in somebody from the Haitian diaspora who is used to getting a lot more money, that doesn't mean that this person is going to have the same kind of salary and, and so on, but at the very least there is a minimum that you have to offer these people in order for them to function. And one of the minimum is the fact that you know, if they're going to do a job, that they are going to be paid in accordance to, to the skills, the knowledge that they bring to the, to the job and nothing else. Um, the third thing is that I think that, you know, yeah, you could achieve a huge amount of trust um, if uh, services were delivered regularly and not haphazardly. Um, in other words, I mean, right now, I mean, I could get, if I own a house in Haiti and I'm sort of a, a, a associated with electrical grid, as a lot, as a lot of you know, um, I could be, uh, I could not be, I could be not having electricity being provided by the electric company, uh, but then I get a bill every month mm -hmm. that says this is how much you owe, and 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 that bill keeps on. Coming and coming and coming. You're trying to uh, reach somebody uh, and trying to have it fixed. It doesn't get fixed. But if you don't pay the bill, you might be in jail. You might be uh, ending up in, 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 uh, under arrest. And God forbid uh, you don't have anybody who can spring you out um, because you might spend a lot of time in jail. I mean, those are the realities in Haiti that undermine the public trust. Um, and to me, that's, uh, that's why a dialogue cannot take place or conversation cannot take place overnight. And it has to be a long process that really builds the confidence that people say, OK, now we know that we are on the same page, and this is where we are going to go with it. OK. We have time for two more questions. They better be very concise. The woman here in the front has had her hand up for a while. The gentleman there. All right. Margaret, I'll give you the third one. But it better be short. I'll be as brief as possible. Janelle Nachter from the National Endowment for Democracy. In our work in Haiti, we invest directly in local Haitian partners and often feel a bit alone in, in that sense. There aren't that many investing directly, particularly in democracy issues that we look at. But my question has to do with, um, Jocelyn, your comments on the playbook. I wanted to ask if we could discuss that just practically. What would we need to do to start to break that? Do there need to be more, more donors willing to take risks to, to have some examples to show that we can invest directly in local Haitian organizations at a greater scale? Or is it just about continuing, the me you know, continuing to spread that message? And then also, is that relevant if we find kind of a convening actor for a potential dialogue or conversation, Hans, like you were calling it? Do we want to specifically, not we, not, not me or Ned per se, but the donor community be targeting you know, fellow donors who are really interested in investing directly in local Haitians so that this process really is Haitian-driven and not another example of perhaps international interference. OK. Um, Margaret, can you, you get the next question? And then the, we'll end up with the gentleman here in the back. Go ahead, Margaret. Here's the, here's the microphone. Um, I, my, I can think my question is very much like this. What, what do you perceive to be the disposition of the donor community to go about uh, making changes in, yeah. in the way they are uh, implementing aid. Okay, and you have the final question. Yeah, there you do. Thank you. Uh, am I on? Yes, you are. Oh, Ernie Prieg, a long experience with Haiti, more private sector oriented these days. Um, my, my point, I agree with almost everything said today, but I don't think enough attention has been given to the need for private sector job creation. And the two principal sectors, traditional labor intensive industry, the newer one, uh, tourism, and just one fact on the first and a question about the second. 
people don't realize that assembly industry has been booming the last four years, right through the earthquake. Apparel and clothing is the biggest one. I, I use imports, the U.S. imports, because they're available. That's most Haitian. Uh, they're up 56 percent, uh, apparel and clothing, from Haiti to over 800 million last year, more, uh, much as aid. They passed by the Dominican Republic, which is only up 10 percent. Haiti's much bigger than the DR as an exporter, Honduras and others. So I think, and as you have more infrastructure in place and you have more management, this could be developed faster. The second question is tourism, the other big one. And here my question is about training. We have huge problems in the U.S. today. People graduating college without any real skills that are marketable. What we're doing in my state of Virginia, vocational training at junior colleges, secondary school. And it's designed by the private sector companies that say, you put this, uh, put this forward and we'll hire all your graduates. So why don't you get some, some vocational training in Haiti in the tourism sector, or even management and technical skills for the assembly industry, and then let, the, let them make sure that these graduates are going to have the skills that are employable, and then you help out with some financing. But let me tell you, these big hotels, they know what, how important it is to have trained people that know what it's all about, and they're willing to make the investment to get those kind of jobs and then hire those people. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, last comments? Hans, you didn't go in the for next last <laughs> round, so you start us off. Right. Um, well, first, to answer Janil and, and, and the question about the donors, I do think that the donors should get together and really one of, of the things we had during the campaign, during Martelly's campaign, realized is that there were, and a lot of people have seen that, that there is a lack of coordination of the donors. Mm -hmm. And obviously when it gets, for example, to the... Um, all, you have all those NGOs coming to Haiti. When they come, they think, <laughs> in, in, in Creole it would be, I don't know, Jardin Papayo, not Jardin Papayo. It means they come into their uh, uh, country that they think that they can do anything they want. And in the end, they come with all the different programs and it's not being coordinated. The Ministry of Planning, who's supposed to coordinate everything, doesn't know about it. Um, and then you have all kind of programs on the field that are being duplicated. And so we do need to put some order in that. And I believe, for example, if we take um, a lot of the donors also have very difficult procedures and, it, and time, and it takes time. Um, I, I give um, Ned a, a lot of compliments for how they work in Haiti because they have been um, really working with the civil society, um, with the, all those organizations, and they respond and they tell you what they really think can be done. And, and there's a donor relationship, but most um, donors in Haiti are not doing that effort, and I think that effort needs to be made. Um, and about vocational training, I'm a big supporter of that. I do think we need professional training in Haiti, professional schools. I believe that. Um, I remember in, in the reading about the first occupation, the occupation of the U.S. occupation in 1915, which was very bad for us in the end because most of the, a lot of trees were cut down actually during the occupation. Um, but one good thing they were trying to do is vocational training. But at the time in Haiti, they said, no, we want classic education. Classical education, we don't want vocational training because they had not understood at the time the need for it. But today, I think that people understand the need for jobs. They want to be employed. Um, and, and, but we do need also to raise, you know, the, for example, the minimum salary level in Haiti. We've been discussing about it, but we cannot just do it without having growth in the economy. So yes, investments are important in the country. Um, I don't think we can just go toward tourism. It's good that there is the, that the apparel industry is coming up because then it creates a job and it creates kind of a buffer for, the, um, for having tourism in, at a later stage. So I, I think that we will get there, but we need also to invest in energy. And investing in energy also means, for example, having systems where all Haitians will pay for energy, because today we're also not paying for energy most of the time. Um, and it's interesting, for example, the energy um, um, system is, is interesting to understand how it works because people tell you, well, you know, they, they have a direct 
connection, meaning that they're not connected directly on, uh, the, to the grid. I mean, not to the official grid, but there is an unofficial grid mm -hmm. with sometimes employees from EDH who themselves are the local distributors and who are making the people pay for electricity when they're actually not paying the EDH company. So we could come up with a new distribution system um, for energy, but we would have to also work on the laws to change that and make it happen. So there are a lot of possibilities, but, and, and we're just starting, I, I think, the discussion on Haiti. There's a lot to do. Um, and, and you were talking about forgiveness. Um, actually, Haitians need to really, it's not a question of forgiveness. I agree with Jocelyn, it's mostly a question of trust. It's mostly a question of being able to sit and talk one to the other. Like we say in Haiti, meaning if I can see or look at you in, in the eyes, I can know exactly if you're telling me the truth or not. So that's what we need to do. Claire, Johanna, and either any one of you want to make a final comment? Just one quick comment on the, how donors can change, because, Margaret, that's an important question. I think the Haitian government after the next electoral cycle should become part of the Busan process. I mean, they are a country that have, re have received so much money, and they need to see other countries who have made the shift away from direct aid and decision-making that becomes owned by the nation to really get that example. And I don't know how much has been done to integrate them into that, but I certainly think taking the Haitian leadership who involved in aid and distribution and bringing them to an environment of like-minded donors from other countries, of war-afflicted countries, would certainly help. Claire? Oh, um, nothing other than a, a huge thank you for all the comments and, and really ask that you um, all engage with us as we consider next steps and we're all ears for any further recommendations. Yeah, I'd like to echo that and say, um, you know, we, we're interested also in hearing ways in which we can take this conversation forward, um, ways in which we can make some of the recommendations real. And I know that Claire and Joanna and, and also I are very open to suggestions from anybody here on how to do that. So thank you very much. And thank you very much, Eric, for, for hosting this. Well, it's our pleasure. I want to thank again the Legatum Institute and Anne for her involvement, the Institute for State Effectiveness, and all of you that came out tonight, uh, tonight, today. Uh, uh, it's so dark in here. It looks like night. <laughs> Especially those of you from Haiti, it's really important, and we're really grateful that you've participated in this discussion. It would be a shame to make a case that we need to involve Haitians more and then exclude them from this discussion. So we're we're most grateful for, the, for that as well. Um, would you join me in thanking our participants, our panelists? Johanna, did you have a last word? I wanted to thank the National Endowment for Democracy for helping to support the travel of Mr. Tippenhauer here. And okay, great. And I want to just thank again my Wilson Center colleagues, especially Veronica Colon, for all the work she's done to put this together today. So thank you all, and let's...